Yeah, you yeah. might be annoyed by that more than you think. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast, and I am joined today with a special guest from across the country down in Southern California. It seems like anybody that's a guest on the show is either from Southern California or uh, Arizona, Nevada area, but uh, it's our side of the world. Lots of going on in the off-road industry. Uh, today, I'm joined by a special guest, uh, Austin Farner uh, from Fish Fishgistics, if you can say that one, one time fast correctly, I'll, I'll give it to you. Um, but uh, he covers a lot of racing in the uh, UTV trophy truck class 11 score uh, international um best in the desert uh, a lot of coverage there and he has a lot of social uh interactivity with the community uh, i thought he'd be cool to bring on and talk about we just got off the episode with uh george hamill talking about uh producing you know a live stream for some of these desert races and, and what goes into that and i thought it would be a good lead-in to go to austin just because of how much he's involved with um commentary and and posting and covering these live events that span hundreds of miles uh but uh today we're joined by austin uh from southern california austin how you doing Good, good. Thanks for having me on today. I'm glad to uh, to be on here and, uh, I don't know, bring some excitement to the show. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, what you got going on. Let's just do a brief, like, macro over level of what you do and, and what you got going on at, at Fish. It's just Fish. I'm going to screw this up the entire episode, I swear. <laughs> That's why we came up with that name. My buddy was like, uh, I was like, I don't know what to call this thing. And somebody came up with that name. And I was like, that sounds totally dumb. I was like, but I really like it because uh, nobody will be able to forget it. But yeah, try and say that five times fast and see if you can. Uh, basically, I, yeah, I cover off-road racing. That's uh, pretty much what I do uh, on social media during the, uh, the big score and the best in the desert races. I do live updates every hour on the hour. Uh, I've been doing it for, I think, going on six years now. And it's uh, continued to grow. And every Everybody really appreciates it, and um, it's just a lot of fun covering all the races and keeping everybody posted. There isn't a lot of race coverage out there of desert racing because it's kind of hard to cover. So uh, you know, it's not just going around in a circle in front of you. So you have to pay attention, and uh, it's it's been fun over the years covering it. So one of the things that I've said multiple times on our show is that racing you know we all have this nomenclature of like racing drives development it drives innovation in the consumer market um and so it's so it's always so disconnected though because off-road racing is so hard to cover uh both in a production standpoint and then social media really never took on to it until the last you know five years or so um especially with teams having to get more involved with their sponsorships to be on social media um you know you, you started not too long ago and it's really grown for you uh, what was it like at the beginning? What spurred this whole like thing to get into covering live racing events? Well, I used to, uh, I used to race actually, you know, I've grown up in the off-road industry the last, uh, 20 plus years. I've been either working in it, racing in it or covering it. And, um, at, in 2015, uh, I retired from the right seat from co-driving for a little while. And then, uh, in 2016, I was just getting all this information during the races. You know, people were texting me and, uh, I was going on race desert cause that was really the only spot that there was any coverage during a race. And I just had all this information coming in that nobody knew about during the race. And I was like, I need to come up with a better way to get this information out to everybody. And like you said, not a lot of teams had their own Instagram or social media back then. So it wasn't that easy for everybody to get out information during the race. So in 2017, I started Fishgistics and doing exactly that, getting everybody's information and putting it out in one spot. And I wasn't sure how it was going to go, but it just caught on and it's just gotten pretty big over all the years. So you started, like, how did you start? Was it just creating a social profile and, and showing? Cause I mean, you couldn't just go to the races and like take pictures everywhere and take video everywhere and start like this whole media production company out of nothing, right? Like how did it all start to create and, and create that localized source of information? Yeah, I mean, really, it's just been my connections that I've made through all of the years. Um, when you're at a race, you actually, you don't know anything, really. Like, you know what's in front of you, and that's about it. So my whole thing was, I'm not going to go to the race. I'm going to stay here in Southern California, and where I have good internet, I have good cell phone service, I have good power, like all of that. I have all that here. I can control all those things all that you don't have in the middle of Mexico. <laughs> that's the problem. Everybody's like, oh, how come you don't come to Mexico during the race? I'm like, because I wouldn't be able to do any of this. Like, it, you know, you might have internet for a few minutes, and then... 
the generator runs out or whatever, you know what I mean? Or the internet goes to crap. So it just, it doesn't work to do it from down there. And you got to do it from up here where you can control those things and have people down there send you that information, you know, when they do have service. So when you start talking about covering the events, uh, I'm assuming that even like even the website information wasn't really like accurate back, you know, in the middle of the 2000s. Um, and so you could you didn't really have a solid live stream of, of data and race results and things like that, let alone the guys that were that were actually part of the race scene covering it uh, for their channels. They're usually all post-production. It's not really this like live thing. Uh, in the last few recent years, we started to see more production go into live and, and commentary and covering uh, live positions and stuff like that. Um, but uh, like when we're talking about this time frame, that 2017 to 2018, uh, social media was really for the off-road scene kind of just taking off. Um, how did, how reliable were you? How, like, I'm thinking I'm thinking about like what you just came off of down in Baja and all the different sources that you had to like manage to get information from and and pick through and then but back then you know was it more of like just a handful of people or was it like you really were so deep with all the different groups that you you still had that logistical challenge of sorting all that data Oh, no, for sure. It's changed a lot recently. Um, I mean, th this last race, the Baja 1000 was the first race that I actually was like overwhelmed a few times um, with the amount of information that I had coming in just between everybody having a Starlink now. Um, most locals down there have cell phones now and have internet and, you know, they're just able to send me information. But when I first started, it was really just, it was the tracker, you know, the online tracker watching the dots go around the screen. And I kind of knew who the dots were and what they were doing and kind of what was going on. So that was what I started with i didn't really have a lot of content coming in during the race um as much as i do nowadays you know that's definitely stepped way up with the technology that's out now just in the last five years so when we talk about that information uh and and looking at the poll results and the position trackers and stuff like that um you know it's easy to to look at it and say okay this person's in the lead or this person's falling behind or, or whatever uh but having that racer mindset and that experience to kind of back up the the vision of those dots um you know how how does that play into what you do and and really how does that give you a perspective on on transmitting that data I, honestly i think that's the biggest thing why people like what i've been doing is because i've i've raced all of this before you know i've done all of this i've done every single race there is besides a dakar i've you know ridden or driven every single class car just about there is from class 11 to trophy truck and i know what goes on during the races so it does help huge to have a perspective like that so when i'm looking at a dot and i see it stop for a minute or two i'm like okay they stopped in the middle of nowhere they were only stopped for about two minutes <clears throat> it was probably just a tire, you know, so that's what my guess. And usually I'm right just from previous knowledge of situations like that. When we talk about tracking, uh, tracking really, you know, I, I don't have like 20 years of, of desert racing experience to know the history of tracking, but I would assume that just with the way that technology has progressed over the last 10, 15 years, um, things have gotten way more reliable, but at the same time, you know, I go to some of these off-road events and these I've been to, to like down to the mint 400 this last season and, or the previous season and realize that even the trackers still have a hard time communicating, uh, a hundred percent accuracy of where they're at at all times. Um, but, uh, in your experience, what's, what's that been like? And that, cause I know you, you on like your website, for example, have the opportunity for racers to have your own trackers on the cars, um, kind of explain to me, you know, how that has evolved for you and, and the information you get from it. And, and just over time, how that's really affected, uh, not only the racers and the information they're getting to know what they need to know, but how, you know, what's going on and how you translate that. Yeah, the trackers have gotten a lot better. <clears throat> the, the, the first early trackers, you know, they they, they weren't good. They had a lot of uh, very high fail rate, and it was hard to uh, get a reliable tracker. They're definitely a lot better nowadays. Uh, they're still not perfect. Like you said, every race there's multiple cars that don't don't track for some reason, or they'll track here and then they'll stop working for a couple hours and then they start tracking again. It's it's all satellite that they're using, you know. So there's a lot of different factors that come into that. If there's canyons or where they put the tracker on the car, doesn't have a real great view of the sky. It'll depend on where they are. 
are. There's a million factors that go into that. But um, yeah, part one other service that I do offer is I, I have my own little spot trackers that we put on trucks. And then I have people here with me that are sending out updates to the team. Uh, every 15 minutes, they'll send out an update of where they are on the course, their speed and all that stuff. And if they ever see the car go to zero, they'll notify the team right away that it's stopped so that they can uh, you know, start figuring out why it's stopped and where they are and everything. But trackers have... They, they've come a long ways, but honestly, they're they're still not great. They they could be a lot better than they are. Do you do you think there's technology out there right now that we could be looking at as as industry people to maybe push our sport further to to have some of this information? Because I look at like, you know, I compare it to like mainstream coverage, right? We talk about whether that be NASCAR or we talk about you know some of these um, just pro grade sport level coverage uh, events where they have so much data coming into them that it's it makes for an interesting storyline, right? Like, is there, have you seen any technology out there that we could look at that maybe incorporates, you know, engine speed or, or you know, whatever dynamics into the, the data outside of just a, a, a plot point on a map? Oh, 100% the answer is Starlink. I mean, if you can have a Starlink on your race car, like a lot of people are starting to do now, you can do all of that. You can have full engine management from anywhere in the world. You can have full data acquisition from anywhere in the world. You can be viewing everything live. You can have cameras all over the car. You can have audio to the drivers. You can have everything. All it takes is that solid internet connection to be able to do that, you know, in a desert race where you're in the middle of nowhere. And with Starlink, that's that's the game changer. It really is. And just in the last few races, we've seen how that's already changed the game and once those units get a little bit more um you know get working a little bit better and they get more satellites up there to have better coverage it's going to be watching a year from now if we have the same conversation that's all we're going to talk about yeah one of the topics i brought up last show was you know the idea that um at some point there's going to be a transition from the race car being 100 percent performance designed to also now having this component of how are we going to show this angle or how are we going to show this piece of information from the car as part of the logistics of building a race car, right? Like, uh, you know, we're so used to seeing GoPro shots over the shoulder or, you know, off the front, you know, a pillar or whatever. Uh, I think that, you know, over time, this is going to turn into something where um, onboard car communication systems, video transmission systems, all that stuff is going to be uh, kind of a big deal, which the consumer will never know, right? Like the, the yeah. consumer is just going to enjoy, consume and regurgitate. We're going to be the, on the backside, busting our balls off to make this thing happen. And uh, it's something that exp excites me as a nerd, as a technology guy for the last 20 some years. Uh, you know, this is the stuff that gets my blood blood flow. It is, is how do we implement this? How do we do this? Um, so I'm excited to see that happen. And I'm excited to see the potential that something like Starlink does bring to the game. Um, there's definitely a lot of hurdles right now. There's a lot of uh, service quality issues to overcome and, and things like that. But, uh, but it's going to get there and it has to start somewhere. And I think it's super cool to see um, you know, the transition, right? Like, like I come from, you know, I didn't really get into the industry until about 2016 and, uh, a little bit before that softly, but seeing the transition from 2016, when the turbo changed the game for everybody, uh, in the UTV scene, um, was really cool to experience. And now I feel like we're in that other side of that, where it's now the media side is starting to catch up and we're going to start seeing that evolve, um, and become more important in the game of off-road racing. Kind of like, uh, kind of like an NFL when, when, when production value made that next level step, uh, I think we're at that, that cusp where we can start to see that happening and the future is going to be completely mind blowing on what we can do with this sport. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's a few organizations that are easier to cover their race than others. Like, for example, King of the Hammers, uh, Dave Cole, he does a great job on that race. You know, the desert race and the ultra four race. He is in a smaller area and can shoot Internet all around the valley. So they have good Internet. They have cameras located everywhere. Um, they have much more control. It's a lot easier to cover that race. Now, when you're talking about a Baja 1000 that goes from Ensenada to La Paz or like next year, it's going to go from La Paz to Ensenada for the first time. And and you're going to be mostly racing at night, honestly. So that changes the whole game right there. So trying to cover a Baja 1000 versus trying to cover a stateside lap race is totally different. And the technology is there right now to cover the stateside race really well. And Dave does a great job at King of the Hammers on covering that race. But trying to cover a Baja 1000, you know, it's just insane. You couldn't do it live. That would be, I mean, you could, but it would take you 30 hours to cover it, you know? So it's 
it's definitely a lot uh, tougher to cover a point to point Baja race than it is a U.S. lap race. Since we're talking about covering these events, uh, what what goes into prepping for, let's say, a Baja race event? What are you doing on on your side to get ready for that? And then what kind of like workflow do you have getting into posting updates and and getting this information? Because over the last couple of years, you know, posts now have a lot more content associated with them. They have a lot more photos, a lot more videos. We now have to talk about like reels and music and like licenses and like all this stupid stuff that we never used to have to worry about. But now we do. Um, kind of what's your process getting ready for a race and executing? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's changed over the years also. Just like you said, every day there's a new algorithm coming out for social media on what you can do, what you can't do, how you do this, how you do that. So in the beginning, I was posting a lot more during the race on my social media because I had more time in between my race updates. Now I feel like I'm so just busy between my race updates. I barely even have time to post anymore. And it, it's all me doing that. You know, some people think I might have you know, multiple people doing that on race day. I have people helping me with the team tracking that I'm doing here. But other than that, the all the social media is all me. So I think I'm at the point where I do need to get somebody to uh, <laughs> or clone myself to have me sitting next to me that's there able to just post on the social media side while I get ready for my next live update. Uh, Cause just trying to get all that information in between a, you know, a 40 minute jump between my 20 minute update is it's getting overwhelming. Definitely. Yeah. I, I talk to people a lot about comparing it with, you know, what you might see on TV on Sunday, right? Like if you're watching football or soccer or any baseball or any of these different sports, um, they just keep the flow moving and moving and moving. Like there's never yeah. downtime and, and there's a lot of data that gets put into that, right? I, I've said data a lot already this episode, but the information that you are relying on to say the words that you're saying has to come from somebody from somewhere through some system yeah. and the logistics of balancing all of that is super difficult. You know, people don't realize that like the NFL, when they start talking about touchdowns and scores and, and statistics and all that, like. There's already like a multi-million dollar system in place to provide that information to the newscasters, let alone the army of people that are, you know, filling out that piece of information that are implementing, that are documenting and, and pushing information to those guys. So uh, totally. I don't think people a lot of times realize how difficult it is to actually one, be on camera. That's not necessarily an easy thing in the first place uh, Two, to 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 be able to talk and, and out what's the word I'm looking for eloquently out, you know, transmit that information from your brain to the consumer. Right. Uh, even right there, just thinking about that made my head hurt for a second. Yeah. But the idea that, you know, our industry is growing to a point now where we're forcing ourselves to grow and, and learn how to do these things is super cool, but also super difficult. And people don't really see that a lot of times. And then when it goes down or there's a, like a dead spot or a, a, a dead stream or something like people get all upset. They're like, why did I even like put my money into this or whatever if they're doing pay-per-view or whatever? Um, yeah, it, there's a, there's a lot that goes into it. And I think that for the most part, our community is pretty lenient. But uh, I think it's super important that we also recognize the fact that we have to support our industry and even those people that are covering it. Right. Like it's it's a difficult task and it's and it takes a lot of time, effort, people, money, things like that. Yeah, I think that, you know, the thing is nobody's <clears throat> nobody's had a standard that's been set, right? Like there hasn't been coverage of anything in off-road really. So anytime, I mean, there was way back in the day, right? ESPN used to cover the races. Um, they did a great job. They had multi-million dollar with ten, tens of, you know, people, 100 people going out to cover the race. They had a full crew trying to do that. When ESPN stopped doing that, nobody picked it up after that. So nobody's been doing it for the last 30 years or 25 years, whatever it was since ESPN did it. So to try to fill in that voice, Avoid. anybody is just starving for information right now so anything that they can get they're going to be stoked on and the one thing that i've always learned is never promise anybody anything it's better to under promise and over deliver than it is to promise them something and then under deliver because like you just said then people get pissed so especially if you're trying to like charge them for something so if they pay for something and then it doesn't work now they're really mad so i would never do that personally you know i would always do what i know is going to work and then if i can do more than that they'll be stoked when I don't tell them about it, but then they see it. Yeah. And I think that there's obviously a, a slight difference with the current, like if, if we just take your channel, for example, fish is six. See, I almost had it that time. If you take <laughs> your channel, uh, <laughs> the more I do it, I'll, I'll get it. The, the more the caffeine from my coffee kicks in, I'll, I'll get it. Um, the more that people have a history of like the way you do things. So like with fish logistics, Hey, got it. The idea go. is that, you know, you've been around for long enough and you have enough content and, and a way of doing things that, you know, 
people can rely on the social stream to kind of fill in the gaps of what they are consuming on TV or, or the stream or whatever, right? And so I think that's just a new way of consuming that our market's adapted to. Um, and I think that we definitely need, we as an industry need to grasp onto that idea that there's going to be multiple sources, multiple points of interest that will come together to create this one big communal media thing. I think that's kind of the future for our off-road coverage group. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I, I am working on some stuff uh, for next year. Um, there's going to be a little bit of change coming to some stuff. So I'm, I'm not ready to say yet what it is, but the coverage is going to get even better next year. And um, I'm incorporating, you know, what I do in with some other people, what they do and everything. So it's going to make it a little bit better, hopefully for everybody. But yeah, I'm excited for uh, for the future. And, you know, specifically, like I've said this a million times, everybody gives me crap all the time, but the Starlink stuff is, it's, it's huge because now you can have people in a pit in the middle of nowhere in Baja or literally in the middle of nowhere, not even in a pit with a live camera that you can be streaming, you know? So now you have cameras all over the course. The only problem is at night, you know, it's still really hard at night. And a lot of the, the longer Baja races are at night. So that's that is tough but yeah the sport is changing a lot and i'm excited to be uh i don't know i think part of it and uh hopefully we can keep making it you know making the coverage better for everybody because the bigger the sport gets that just helps everybody right um that brings in more sponsors that brings in more race teams the race teams are able to get sponsors it just it makes you know the more attention that it gets is is better now some of the old old people are going to be like oh we don't want the attention get off my lawn this is my baja we want it the way it was always you know and like that's cool too but you got to look at it like this is not sustainable if um if you don't have the money coming in you know everybody everybody's not rich that goes racing right there is a lot of the grassroots guys that if they didn't have the sponsors they wouldn't be able to race so i i think it's fun to see it all come together and just uh, i don't know i'm excited for the future when we talk about sponsors um and and you have a history of racing different vehicle groups and and different teams and different sponsorship levels things like that um you know when we talk about the future of off-road racing there's a lot of discussion around the idea that utvs are kind of taking over right like it's this this trend of like these trucks got so big so capable so expensive now the utv comes in is almost as equally capable in most areas as these bigger trucks but at a different price point so it, it, it kind of brings a freshness to the sport um what's your perspective on kind of like the history of truck racing and the evolution into the utv racing yeah you know back in the day like i was a golf cart hater right like i still call them golf carts they're still golf carts i'm always <laughs> gonna call them golf carts right there's no getting away from that they're just fast golf carts now but yeah back in the day you know they they were pretty slow and i used to give them a lot of crap and people would give me crap for giving them crap and and now i have one too and it's super fun right but yeah they, they've definitely brought a whole new aspect to the sport you know that they have factory um oems coming to race speaking of which there's a big one coming soon um they have the oems getting behind these teams they're dumping dollars into these teams they are they're putting money in the sport that's helping like i said before a lot of people that might have not been able to come racing now they're able to come racing with the help of this factory backing or you know there's so many parts that companies are making for them now that those companies didn't make parts for trucks before you know so now you have all these new companies and new uh people coming into the sport so i think it's a good thing and uh, you know they are getting really fast you always have the class 10 versus utv you know rivalry going and uh, some races they're faster some races they're not just depends but I, I think it's fun and i think it is good for the sport to have the utvs around you know they, they get a lot of crap from people but in the end i think it is good to have them uh you know in the sport one thing you just said was you know utv market has a bunch of manufacturers making parts for these cars whereas like if you have a trophy truck you can't go down you don't you don't just go to like four wheel parts and like tr type in billet trailing arm for a <laughs> yeah. class 10 right yeah. like it doesn't work that yeah. way um and so there are some spec truck you know things but i think that's more contractual with just the builders and, and all that so you're really still not getting parts per se uh in an aftermarket sense uh but that's also why we don't see trophy trucks driving down the street normally so i guess that's a good thing but um but the but that whole structure the economic structure of of an aftermarket support for an oe car that you can go buy um really has a lot of potential to drive a sport and an industry further ahead and i think that's something that like polaris really did right from the very beginning right they never went after people for making aftermarket parts they never really went uh to anyone and said you can't do this with our product they said you know take it run with it go do what you want to do with it 
Um, and, uh, and there's some, there's some aftermarket or there's some, some builders coming into market. We have, uh, you know, potentially a speed car coming. That's the big joke, uh, that a lot, <laughs> a lot of people in racing like to make fun of, but you know, that has the potential to mix things up a little bit. Right. Um, yeah. and, uh, I think that as, as more people come into the sport, more people come into just off-road in general, the more interest we're going to have here. And, um, is there any kind of trend you see happening in our sport as far as like over the last few years or so, as far as, I don't know, just the way that teams work together or approach media different, or just the industry in general, adapting to the idea that we need to work with media partners to cover these events. Yeah, I think just the the whole social media aspects has blown up the last, you know, five years. Like you said, when I first started this in 2017, most of these teams didn't even have their own social media. Uh, maybe some of the people did, you know, they had a personal one, but they didn't have a team one back then. And they didn't have guys doing video recaps and putting together videos and doing all this stuff. Now, almost everybody has that. Like you have to, if you want to get a sponsorship now. So people care more about, honestly, it's kind of sad in a way, but people care more about social media than race wins nowadays, really. Um, some sponsors like you'll get more money from a sponsor if you have more followers and get more attention on social and you might suck at racing but you get a lot of attention so they still want that attention you know so it's it's good and bad um you just you kind of got to go with it you know but the, the biggest change in the past five years has been social media by far yeah that's definitely something we've talked about before when we had conversations around sponsorships and how people can get into the sport and things like that the idea that some companies are more interested in lifestyle association than they are with a trophy position. Um, but, and I, and I tend to see the bigger sponsorships looking for that more than the smaller sponsorships. Smaller sponsorships are wanting to get race proven. They're wanting to get, you know, podium proven. They're wanting to get um, destination proven. Uh, and so really that's kind of a big deal for people that are looking for, looking for sponsorships on their teams. Um, but uh, has anything changed outside of just those two goals as far as like how teams get put together, how big the teams are like, is there now a dedicated media person on each one of these teams? Like how, how does that vibe go with, with these long desert races? Yeah, I think a lot of teams have a dedicated media person now. You know, I mean, at least all the big teams, I don't know if you're specifically talking about UTVs, but all of the big teams like trophy truck teams and all those guys, they all have a, a person on payroll, a lot of them now that is doing their media, you know? So the level of videos and pictures and race recaps and pre-run stories and vlogs and blogs and all that stuff is, it's definitely stepped way up, which is good for the sport once again, because it's just bringing more attention to it. So with more attention comes more money, comes more sponsors, means more people can race it means the races get bigger they get more attention it's just it's good all over in my opinion you know but definitely that has that has stepped up a lot uh recently if you don't th there's no way you can go and try and get a sponsorship now and they're not going to ask you about your social media followers or postings or what you're going to do on social media that is that's a part of every contract now right it's, it's an expected bullet point now and and i think that those that execute well are going to be the ones that get more opportunity um and you know I, I think that we as consumers on the consumer end of it, I'm a consumer advocate. That's who my goal is to, to advocate for. Um, you know, we stand to benefit a lot of this. Uh, when we talk about the sheer number of different angles, you can get that information at and what you're trying to do, where you're trying to consolidate some of that information into um, a single place. Um, what's kind of like, how do we, how do we better aggregate some of this content? Like we, What's the best way to discover new teams and bring new content in and and all that? Because I, as a person that's not been down southwest where I'm just like right down the road from race teams or at a local drivable distance to a race or something like that, um, you know, I'm always discovering new racers, new teams like, holy crap, this guy has 100,000 followers. And I didn't never even knew this guy's name up until this point. How are how are how are we as opposed to and as an industry supposed to find these guys and, and start to to follow these guys? Well, you look at fish logistics, obviously, right? <laughs> I mean, <duh. laughs> no, I don't know. You know, it's, uh, I mean, nowadays you can, you can look up a race and look at the results and just look up their name and you can find everybody on social media, right? Like I do after a race, I do, um, race recap shows where we do on zoom. We have, uh, people from different classes come on, whoever had a good story or I'll take the top couple from a couple different classes. And I haven't talked to all of them sometimes. So I just go on 
social media and look them up. And then I send them a message on Instagram usually and they reply right away. It seems like almost everybody has an Instagram now. So it's not that hard to find somebody. Um, like I said, I would just look at the race results and just start randomly looking up people if you want. And then you can, you know, see who's doing what. And, oh, I've seen this person's name at the top a lot. And then you can go look it up and see what they're doing. So you brought up Instagram. You also have a Facebook page with almost equally uh, the same number of followers and stuff like that. Those two platforms are drastically different in the way that people like consume and, and communicate. Um, for for like maybe a race team or a consumer looking to better you know interact with some of these people, um, what are the differences there, and, and ha- what which one does what better? Yeah, that's a good question, really. So <clears throat> when I first started in 2017, it was all about Facebook. Uh, not a lot of people had Instagram then, um, and I had way more followers on Facebook. And then over the past couple of years, that Instagram has just caught up to the Facebook, and now it's surpassed it, and that one's growing way more than the Facebook is. So I have... Uh, a feeling that a lot of people have transitioned away from Facebook and they're now using Instagram more. The only thing is there's, there is differences. You can go live on Facebook, but you can't really go live on Instagram. I mean, you can, but it goes as like a story and then it's kind of weird and it's just not the same. Like going live on Facebook is a lot easier. So when I do my live updates, they're not live on Instagram, they're live on Facebook and they're live on YouTube at the same time. Um, so a lot of people, if they don't have a Facebook, they can go watch me on YouTube at least, but definitely it's a different platform. I think a lot of people have transitioned to Instagram just because they don't want all like the whiny bullshit of everybody on Facebook, right? Like people on there complaining about their wives or girlfriends or this or that, like you go on Instagram, it's just pictures and video. You're just, you're just scrolling and you're just looking at cool content. You know, you're not, nobody's on there crying about something or anything where you go on Facebook and you just see these long posts from people and you're just like, whatever, I'm over this. So I think that's why a lot of people have transferred over to Instagram over Facebook. Yeah, the the nice thing about Instagram is it's it's just a visual feed, right? Like you don't really have to dive into the the discussion if you don't want to, and I think that's the biggest difference. Yeah. Um, and for off road racing, everyone wants to see the whoops or the jumps or the you know the rollover or whatever, and it's a good way to communicate that without really investing your time. Um, so when we talk about discussions online and stuff like that, you haven't shied away from being a little controversial from now and now and again and having an <laughs> opinion and, and all that. How has, you know, that process evolved over the years? You know, when we when we're in the thick of racing and, and we're just a scrappy team, a lot of times we have and I say we like I do this all the time, but I'm not I'm not a racer. So I'm just assuming a lot of this. But uh, from the people I talk to, there's a lot of this like this. um ego that gets involved and a lot of a lot of uh calling out and a lot of opinion put out there um and that can quickly spoil you know the mix uh with a with a few key people having bad attitudes about stuff but it seems like there's a fairly healthy i don't want to say argument but a fairly healthy ecosystem of opinions in our sport that like to go back and forth especially when we talk about brands or or upcoming you know vehicles that aren't out yet or you know, whatever the case may be, um, there's always a healthy opinion and, and uh, pool of people with opinions to throw back at each other. How has that changed, you know, for for your side when you're talking about being both a commentator and a reporter of the information? Like, how do you approach that? Well, yeah, me personally, I've never really been a, a PC person, you know, politically correct person too much. Uh, back in the day, that's how all of our, uh, like the truck behind me, that was when we were racing 1450. And everybody talks shit to everybody, right? Like if you weren't, there was something wrong with you. Like everybody was, and that made it just so much more fun. You know, I don't know, back in like desertrangers.com days. And it was just, it was fun doing that, you know? So I, I try to do that now. I don't do it as much, obviously, cause I got to be a little bit nicer about it, but it, it's good to get in there and shake things up. You know, I like to call people out. If people do something stupid, I don't have a problem calling them out. If I do something stupid, somebody call me out. Like that's, that's fine. Right. I'm not trying to you know, I don't know. I just, I like to see people do the right thing and have fun at the same time. And a lot of people with social media, it's easy for them to post something and not get called out on it all the time. So I like to, you know, maybe call people out here or there. (laughs) So when we talk about covering these events, you have, like you said earlier, you know, you're covering both score and, um, best in the desert, kind of what's the difference between covering both of those? I I would assume that best in the desert is a little bit easier to cover just because it's a little more localized where, you know, some of these other score races can get pretty, pretty spread out. What's, what's the difference for you? 
Yeah, the difference is usually uh, how much information I have coming in. Obviously, a best in the desert race is very hard to spectate because it's not open spectating everywhere. You can really only go to the pits and you're not allowed to go anywhere on the race course. It's on a lot of closed land. They only have permission to use that race course. So you don't have people standing all over the course at different areas at high speeds that are sending me content and stuff. So a best in desert race, I'm way more limited on the content I get. And a lot of times it's just stuff coming through the pits, which all have a speed limit. So they're not super exciting to... Uh, to see people coming through the pits, you know? So, you know, in Baja, it's everything goes, it's the wild west down there. So you have people everywhere, people where they shouldn't be. You definitely get a lot more uh, exciting content from Baja. Although the U S races, um, you know, best in the desert, it is fun to, you know, Vegas Reno, that's always a big race. I always get a lot of stuff from that race, but definitely the the majority of the exciting content and stuff comes from score in, in Mexico. So when we, when we look at racing in general, there's kind of a couple different storylines that are, I would say, commentary friendly, right? There's the build up to the launch, getting off the starting line. There's the, you know, pole position on the the racers themselves during the race. And then there's kind of this ending story of who's across the line, when they're across the line, how they got to there. Um, I would I would be pretty safe in saying that that middle part is the hardest one to cover. Um, you know, obviously knowing where someone's at is one thing, but just having the storyline, the information around what's going on, um, you know, radio communication systems have really gotten, you know, a lot better over the years, uh, but there's still not an internet shareable stream of information, right? Like you're not able to just sit yeah. there at your house across the country, listening to the radio streams. Um, but well, I think kind of, <laughs> You can, you know, for the, for the Baja races, um, PCI weatherman, he does stream the weatherman channel. So you can be anywhere in the world and you can listen to the weatherman channel, which if you guys don't know what the weatherman channel is, that's the big, uh, information channel for the race. That's the race ops channel. Basically race ops themselves has another little channel, but anything that's going on during the race, everybody talks about it on weatherman and he goes up on top of a mountain, usually Mount Diablo somewhere where it's really tall, where he's going to have a lot of uh, radio reception. And he does broadcast that live so that is pretty cool that you can listen to at least something no matter where you are yeah for sure and 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 it's as a consumer if you're into desert racing if you're into these long races you kind of you've heard that name before or you know what it is uh and that's a whole different topic i'd love to get him on the show and and talk about the logistics of setting that system up and just some of the history there there's a lot of really interesting history with weatherman um and the integration with the racers and and the industry um but as far as like following teams and knowing their storylines along the way it's almost like there has to be a helicopter or a camera there for you to really understand what's going on with that team um and when we talk about desert racing i mean to cover that would be an army of of media people capable of doing that do you see a future where there may be a solution where it's more like multiple groups working together as a seamless organism to kind of create this stream of content and information. And it's up to, you know, each different media house to produce it how they want. Or do you foresee it as something over time is just going to be a bigger and bigger army of one group that covers these events? Honestly, I think having that many different people try to work together during the desert race won't, won't really work. There's too many different variables um, of just what could go wrong, who's supposed to be where, who's supposed to be doing that to try to get that many different people. I'm talking about live to, to get that many different people to try to work together live. I don't really see that happening. I see the race organizations themselves stepping their coverage up and making their own coverage better, whether that be them, you know, obviously hiring more people, adding on more cameras with the use of Starlink. You can have more cameras around the course. I think it's on the race organizations themselves to start stepping up their video production, you know, during the race, the live video production. And I think we're going to see some big changes coming to that uh, this next season. The smile on your face uh, gives me hope for a few things. Um, the The history of, of creating uh, a whole new industry of media sur- surrounding a race scene or, or something like that has usually been this topic of who can we how can we get a network to get behind this right whether that be you know fox or cbs or espn or or somebody like that right like that's always been kind of the traditional behind the scenes discussion is how can we make this network friendly to where they would want to to buy into this right uh but i feel like the the what we're looking at is a future of like it's going to be on us it's going to be on the race groups, it's going to be on the teams that make these things happen to, to produce this yeah. and put this out there in the world. 
there there's potential for better revenue that way but there's also a lot more work and investment that has to be put into that because that's not who we are right we're not yeah. this big production like you go to the mint they have a million dollar trailer sitting there with a bunch of video switchers inside and people working it and and all that but that's not theirs like they're not that's not what's going on they're they're just bringing that technology in um and so i think that's kind of what you know, we're, we're having to look at is how do we scale? How do we bring in funds to sponsor this? Do you, for, do you foresee a couple of years of, of struggling to make this happen and work and, and succeeding at the end to where it, then the investment comes in to really push it into the stratosphere? Or do you see it kind of already happening? Well, I think it's already in the works at, you know, a few of these organizations, like I said, um, you know, King of the Hammers, they do a very similar thing to, you know, to what you said with the mint, both, both of those are lap races in a controlled environment or semi-controlled environment. So it's really easy to step those up and be doing that thing. And both of those, like you said, they have the live event trailer. Uh, I've worked with King of the Hammers the last four years, either sitting inside the trailer or helping the producer, or actually the last couple of years doing the commentary on the, sh- on the race itself. So um, yeah, that is currently being st- stepped up. The thing, once again, is when you try to get a very long race, it, such as in Baja, Baja 1000, it's going to take a lot to be able to cover that. And you mentioned TV. How do you put a 30 hour show on TV? Like they right, have the right. 24 hours of Le Mans on TV, right? But that's on like ESPN two or whatever it is. Um, to try to put a live show for 30 hours on TV is it would be almost impossible. I don't honestly see that happening anytime soon. I think, I don't even think you have to nowadays, honestly, if you can get your live streaming on the internet to be big enough and good enough, I think that will get almost as much coverage as putting it on TV would, would you can't do a, you can't really compare it to sports because they're a two hour event, three hour event, right? Like the Super Bowl, a World Series, a baseball game. It's a couple hours and it's in one thing. Even a NASCAR race, it's a couple hours and it's in one thing. Our sport is not like that. You, you can't you can't do that. It, it will never work. You know, I think you need to you need to do it totally different. And if you try and do it like that. It, it doesn't come out good. Even look at the, the post race shows that they put on TV. Everybody already knows who won, right? Like an off-road race comes out a month or two later. I don't even remember the last time I watched one of those personally, because I already know everything that happened. So, you know, why would you watch it? it you know, maybe if you're in the race, you want to see if you're going to be on the show. That That's cool. But to me, I want to see it live and I want to see it now. And I think that's where everything is nowadays is people want to see stuff now. They don't want to see it in a month or two. And there's the idea that, you know, social is right alongside of that. It's not just a single channel that you're looking at anymore. Um, and when we talk about, like like you were saying, with the the, the 24-hour Le Mans or, or any of those shows, or even just literally like a football game, like that's only a couple few hours long, whatever, people don't realize how much content is pre-made to get spliced into that live yeah. coverage to make that interesting, right? Like even if oh, you're yeah. watching, you know, NASCAR or, or Le Mans or any of those rate F1, like there's all these pre-edited content pieces that you almost have to have just as much pre-produced content as you're planning on going live, just because you have to mix it in the entire time to make things yeah. interesting. Um, and that's where I like commentary is kind of hard. Like you can get, the be up up to like getting off the starting line it's almost like that's the easy part is talking about yeah. who's there what they're doing who their sponsors are what they've done to get there and then once they start going then it's a matter of okay well if everybody's running a clean race now what do we talk about like there's it's yeah. it's commentary is a lot harder than people think yeah and honestly that's why when i do my updates i go live at the top of the hour and i talk for 15 or 20 minutes and then i'm done and I stop talking, right? And I close it down, shut it down, come back on the next hour. Because if I tried to stay live the whole time, it'd be boring as shit because there's nothing to talk about. You know, you got to get your information. Like you just said, it's all in that 40 minutes that I'm not talking. I'm on my phone. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on here, there I'm in on phone calls. I'm getting all the information ready to then go live again at the next update. So that way that next update is new information. And I was able to have time to gather it all. You know, like I said, I'm a one man show on race day. As far as that, I don't have a producer sitting next to me. I don't have anything like that. So it's, that's the toughest part for me is trying to find all that information and get it ready to go for the next hour update. And when, now, when you're trying to stay live the whole time, that's, you know, it's tough. There's nothing to talk about a lot of the times, especially when it gets dark. Now you don't have that many cameras. You can't see much. Well, what are you supposed to talk about? You know, so it's, it is tough trying to go live to cover like a long Baja 500, Baja 1000, Vegas, Reno. There's a lot of downtime in between there. Especially when you talk about night, like you said, you know, 
uh, visually for a production group to to try to cover that you can only show a white dot in a black screen so many times uh yeah. before you get sick of that and um even with how good cameras are these days right like it's just it's not going to work when the only light you have is the moonlight like it's just not going to be a visually entertaining piece of content and the reality of it is most people are in bed by 10 11 and 12 o'clock at night on race day right as far as the consumer yeah. side so then your return on that's really not there as well but at the same time that's where a lot of drama happens is that night. Like how, when you, when you miss the corner or when you see something, you don't see something coming up at you cause it's out, no lights are on or whatever. Um, there's a lot of drama at night, but it's, it's so hard to cover. And I think that's what makes our sport so unique is just the aspect of, you know, speed, danger, storyline, drama, team, sh- team built, you know, collaboration and, and all this other stuff that has to happen, the logistics side of it. Um, and I think that's why it's so important for teams to really show that behind the scenes and show how much of a, of a process this is, how many people are involved, like the teamwork that goes into this, like the driver's job is just one small piece of the bigger puzzle. Um, when we talk about racing and getting into, you know, these big events, kind of what are some of your biggest memories of, of covering this? Obviously you have racing history there and there's probably a thousand different memories from that. Uh, but as far as covering these events, what are some of the big, the big events that really kind of like are on the top of your uh, favorite memory lists? Well, you know, the most exciting is when there's a good battle for the lead, right? Like everybody likes the class 11s. Everybody likes the limited buggies, class 10s. That, that's all cool, right? But the most exciting thing is the trophy trucks or trick trucks at Best in the Desert by far. That's that's what 90% of the people tuning in are looking to see is what's going on in that race. So I kind of I kind of make sure I'm always really covering that, right? Because they're going for the overall, they're up front, they're all that. Some of the most exciting races were, you know, a couple Baja 500s have been literally within seconds. You know, one was six seconds, I think, a couple years ago. So these these races are coming down to a couple seconds um, at the finish line. Those are always the most exciting. You know, even the Baja 1000 this last year, the first half of it, um, the one that just happened, the first half of the race, we had lead change between Bryce Menzies, Rob McCacker, and then Rob got a flat, then this happened or this happened you know what i mean there was just it was going back and forth so the races where there's lead changes and stuff like that are definitely the most exciting uh, out of all of them yeah and when i when i look back at kind of just some of the highlights that i have over the last year or so you know there was you know there was times where uh who was it the 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 two guys that were bumper to bumper flying over the street and they got caught on camera you know flying off together uh that was pretty who who was that i can't remember at the Laughlin race you're talking about? I think so, yeah. Yeah, it was Jurgensen and um, Grabowski. Yeah, that sounds right. But uh, yeah, the spec trucks. It was, yeah, it was. It's moments yeah. like that that you know you don't get. Like those are the epic moments, like that make the sport cool. Uh, or yeah. like when Lauren Healy was coming down uh, the Ultra Four race and his in his new Bronco and like dropped whatever like that 15, 20 feet was and just like nailed oh, yeah. it. Uh, <laughs> those those are amazing moments in our racing history, like where it's like visually it just connects everybody to go, oh man, that's amazing. Um, yeah. Are are there any moments in in your coverage over the last few years or so where out in the desert it just was like just such a crazy battle or a crazy moment where it really kind of like you wish you had five cameras there, man, that's a good, that's a good one. <laughs> uh, I don't know about that. Honestly. I mean, I'm sure there was a lot of them really. Uh, I'm trying to think of one, you know, well, like this Baja 1000, I didn't see it, but we heard that, you know, Rob McCachran got around Bryce Menzies and to get around Bryce Menzies when he's running, I don't remember the last time somebody passed Bryce when he was running. So Rob had a better line than Bryce. And that to me was like, hmm, that that's weird. Like Bryce usually has all the good lines. How did Rob get a good line on him that he didn't know? So, you know, there is stuff like that, which we never got to see. It would have been awesome if we could, if we could see that, you know, maybe we will. Menzies helicopter probably had it, but uh, you know, stuff like that makes it exciting to know that that stuff still does happen. You know, the best of the best get are still battling it out and it, it might come down to one line, you know? Yeah, it's so crazy how a split second decision can really change the game for a racer in these long races. It, it, we we talk about how, um, you know, it may be like okay, it, it, we we can save a, a second here or two, and it, and and it might not change the course of the of the race. 
But if you can make a change and it takes away an hour because you made the wrong decision, like that's that's where the race is one is when you ma- do not make those decisions. Right. Um, and oh, that yeah. comes from, you know, a big experience factor, but also racing in the desert is a lot of luck. Like people, <laughs> people yeah. forget to remember that there's a lot of luck <laughs> in desert racing. Um, but uh, yeah, so let's get um, a little bit of I, you, you. We kind of glossed over the fact that you got into off-road racing and been in it for a long time. How did that whole transition start? What was a, what was a young Austin before off-road racing and how did young Austin become off-road Austin? <laughs> well, that's where my nickname fish comes from. So, um, I was, you know, really into fishing back in the day and I actually bought this truck you see behind me here. It was completely stock, uh, Toyota four wheel drive, 1992 four wheel drive pickup. And I bought it in 2000 year, 2000, I was 16 years old. And I started building it into a pre runner and I was on racedesert.com all the time. And my nickname on there was fish dude. And <laughs> that's kind of where fish came from. Anytime I would go to a race or anything, instead of it being fish dude was here, it was like, Oh, fish is here. Fish, fish, fish. So then it kind of just, it kind of just stuck. So that's how I first got into uh, off-road racing was back then. And then we ended up building it into a race truck and won a couple championships and just all kinds of fun back in the day. And then it's just evolved from, uh, from there. But I always say that those, those days racing in 1450, which is a pre-runner class, um, you actually, you had to have a license plate on your car when we started that racing that class originally. Um, it was fun. We would drive the truck to the race and then you drive it home. And like, it was, it was a super fun class and, uh, made a lot of good friends back then. And it just, it evolved from there. You know, we'd, we'd be at the race racing these things and a real trophy truck would show up every once in a while. And we'd just be like, Whoa, man, that thing is awesome. You know, like, and just, it just, I don't know. It never, I never turned back from there. <laughs> So when you say you were into fishing, were you like competitive fishing? No, it was just deep sea fishing for fun. Um, just out here in Southern California, deep sea fishing is actually really, really good here. You know, probably the best in anywhere in the United States, obviously, probably for a lot of these fish. And um, it's a lot of fun. So I was just, I was doing fishing all the time from the time I was, you know, young, 10, 11 years old. And then just kind of transitioned from fishing more into the off-road stuff, got a little bit more into that. But I still go fishing, you know, a bunch during every year. I have my own charters and everything. So I still keep doing that, but it's just, uh, it's transitioned more into the off-road side which actually works out well because fishing you mostly do in the summertime and there's not really a lot of off-roading in the summer going on so it kind of works out well in the winter when a lot of the off-road racing is in the spring and stuff is uh i'm not doing as much fishing so so when you talk about fishing turned into racing and and that's kind of what you do uh what do you do in the off time what what is uh day-to-day austin look like um, well, day to day is I now work for PCI race radios. So I'm working for PCI doing their marketing and social media. So, uh, I'm doing that. And then I do fish logistics, you know, just doing all kinds of different stuff for that during in between the races, but, um, day to day is PCI and, um, it's really cool, you know, working with weatherman. And like you said, you know, he's got awesome. There's awesome history there. I've always been huge fans of, uh, you know, everything weatherman and PCI and all that's ever done. So, so that works out well. And that keeps me in contact and doing race stuff, you know? that's I'm I'm in the community and I'm in the community all day every day you know so it's tough to uh it's, it'd be really hard to do anything else really so since you have the tie-in to the race radio side of things um you know over the years uh there's a couple few different players in the in the radio market for our racing um and they all basically do the same kind of thing right uh and to various levels of of compatibility and and technologically you know advanced or not advanced or filtered or not filtered all these different things um what is kind of like the core key kit that you would recommend for anybody that's looking to you know attend a desert race and listen in or like you know what's kind of like the go-to kit for anyone that's wanting to get into racing and following the race teams and weatherman and, and stuff like that. Well, it depends on what you're doing. You know, if you're using a, uh, you know, a UTV side by side, um, it's kind of a little different package than you get for your chase truck. Um, just comes packaged differently, but you know, the biggest thing to remember is when you are at a race and you're listening to weatherman, um, always unplug your microphone because you don't want to get a stuck mic on the weatherman channel, which is one, five, one, six, two, five. That is the weatherman channel. So, um, yeah, PCI, I don't want to like do a sales pitch, but PCI will get you hooked up with whatever you need. And, uh, it's always fun if you're at a race to just monitor the weatherman channel 
or um, whatever channel. Best in the Desert has their own channel that they use for race ops. So if you're at a Best in the Desert race, you would monitor a different channel at a Best in the Desert race. But yeah, you can you can learn a lot. You know, you can hear checkpoints calling in cars as they come by. You'll hear so and so is flipped over here. Got to send in a recovery here and there. It just it makes the race more exciting. And you know what a lot of the teams do nowadays is they have two radios in their car. And this is actually a really good idea in your chase truck to have two radios. So you can have one radio that just monitors Weatherman or the race ops channel, and then your other radio is your race channel where you're actually talking to the race truck and the chase crew. That way you might hear something sometime on the race ops or the weatherman channel that's pertinent to your race car, but you could still be on the race car channel talking to them at the same time. That was one thing that I picked up. Uh, I think it was late last year was picking up on a team that was doing a scenario like that where they had multiple radios in the car. And it was interesting to me that the racer, he had one com to basically his co-driver and then the co-driver was negotiating the back and forth between all the different channels and the different radios um and so it, it really does bring kind of like a, a spotlight to that co-driver and how important they are in, in off-road racing um yeah. you know we we focus a lot on the drivers so much is focused on the drivers getting the car across the line and all that but so much weight is put on the co-drivers uh to make sure that that happens and there are some classes that you know that's it's iron man it's by yourself it's whatever um but but the co-drivers really deserve a lot of respect. And I think um, that's kind of one of those storylines that our industry has the opportunity to grow into, right? Like we can cover that other side of racing, the team part of it, the the people that are making this happen and the co-driver, you know, listening into his conversations. And I think it'd be super interesting. You know, NASCAR has started doing that thing where they start talking to the drivers while they're in their warm-up laps or whatever the case may be. Uh, that'd be super cool to be able to talk to a co-driver, like when they're in a straightaway or something like, Hey, how you guys doing? Like, you know, what, 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 what went on the last two miles? Like, what are you looking at going forward? I think that'd be a really cool op. I mean, obviously, logistics of pulling that off are way <laughs> a, a very complicated part of that. But I think it would be super cool to be able to tie into some of these, um, maybe the front running five teams or, or something like that. Yeah. Well, I've done that. I've actually done that before. Um, during the uh, Baja races, a lot of people run the MSAT system. And it's basically, it's a satellite system that you can use voice over. So I've actually had an MSAT here uh, at my office during the race and talked to cars that were on in the race racing. And I've talked to them on the MSAT while they're racing. Um, it's, it's a tough thing because you don't want to bug them when they're, you know, on the course, cause you wouldn't want them not to hear a co-driver call out or something like that. So, you know, doing it to like the top trophy trucks is always a little bit, uh, you got to be careful where you do it. There is a lot of road se road sections in Baja or speed zone sections. So if you're looking at the tracker and you know that so and so is in one of those sections, that's always a good time to try and call them. So yeah, that's that's actually easily done because a lot of people run the MSATs now down in uh, in Mexico, and you can talk to them live if they want to. <laughs> yeah, that that would be super cool to, to see that grow. That's that's very. I, I, that any tie into a, like an active team would be just super cool to be able to talk to them. And I think that's, you know, following chase trucks would be super interesting. Some of those guys in the chase trucks, by the way, have way too much fun down in Mexico. Um, yeah. And uh, some of them, you, you can tell who, who's been there a number of times and who's new because the guys that are new are just so focused on whatever the next task is. And the guys that have yeah. been there like 10, 20 times, they're all like, you know, eating, stopping for tacos, like just moving through as they go <laughs> and, and uh, seeming pretty, pretty comfortable. Um, uh, you know, with your experience down in that area of the world, you know, what are some of your favorite places to go and, and visit and, and especially during race day, like what are some of the cool things that you get to do? Well, race day always sucks. All right. I'll just say that right now. Race day <laughs> is horrible and racing is stupid. The most fun part about Baja is pre-running. Pre-running is where it's at. Even if you're not racing, going down and pre-running. And if you are racing, pre-running, you'll have way more fun than race day. Trust me. You are so stressed out on race day and just in a hurry and you can't sleep. You don't want to eat. You, you don't want to do anything on race day because your stress level is just all the way up here. So on, during pre-running is when you can have all the fun. You can stop at the taco shop here you can go to the beach here you can check out this line over here that's that's where you have all the fun is during the pre-run why do you think these guys go down and pre-run for two weeks you, you think they're really like working for two weeks like no i mean they are but they're working for two weeks right like you have a lot of fun down there and you know you can go to this bar here you can go over to this restaurant you can do whatever on the pre-run so if you're ever going to go to mexico and you've never been going to the race is cool if you want to see race cars on race day but if you want to go and like do something down there go pre-running it's way more fun I was talking to um, a 
dealership owner up here in the Northwest. And he was talking about, um, you know, taking some spec cars down to, or some, some built up, uh, UTVs down to the Baja and doing a couple of weeks of pre-running and ending their trip on race day where everybody takes off and then taking off from there. So they weren't even staying for the full race, but they were there to experience yeah. Baja and, uh, all the craziness that happens down there beforehand. And, you know, they were coming back with stories of pre-running with this team and that guy and that, whatever it's like, cause they were all just kind of learning from each other and having fun and the experience. And, and one guy, you know, finds a, a trap and communicates it to the other guys and, you know, whatever the case is. And yeah, they have a bunch of broken parts when they got back, but they have stories to go with it. Right. And, uh, yeah. and then all the partying that happened and then up to race day, they get to cheer for their guys, you know, that they met down on the pre-run and, and see them off and all that. And then they get to come home and, and see the results of the race. And it was kind of an interesting story to hear from somebody who had first experience uh, doing that. Uh, that's a pretty cool trip. If anybody was looking to do something different and, and travel and, and experience a different type of off-roading than we get here in the States. Yeah, it's totally different. And, you know, during the pre-running, everybody's always helping everybody. You know, like I said, on race day, everybody's stressed out. Like you might help somebody, you know, you might not. Depends on what class they are, who they are, or whatever. But <laughs> during the pre-run, if you come across somebody that's broke, everybody's going to stop. You know, nobody's just going to drive right by you. They're all going to stop. They're going to help you. They're going to give you a spare part if they have it. Um, they'll help you do whatever to get out of there. You know, you're stuck. They're going to pull you out. It's all about the camaraderie. And everybody knows that in Baja, first you have to beat Baja, right? So everybody's down there together to have fun and and it's just, it, it really is a good time. Like I have way more fun pre-running than anything else I do. Like, it's just, it's a total different mindset. And, um, it's just, you know, it's a lot of fun. If you have never done it, I would suggest trying to go with the race team some times. And, you know, here's the thing where UTVs and side-by-sides have really made a big difference is in pre-running. Look, look at all these trophy truck teams. Almost all of them have a side-by-side -side or a UTV that they will go and pre-run in Baja with, um, the McMillans, like they'll take their UTVs down for the first time around. So that way they can kind of mark the course, look at any little lines that they want to run later. They can stop. They won't get stuck they can turn around in a sand wash you know it, the utvs have really changed the game in pre-running that you know they're not the fastest you're going to go a lot faster in your trophy truck pre-runner but they come in very handy you know handy being able to find these lines and not getting stuck and stuff so that's one way that they've changed the game in pre-running down there so speaking of uh side by sides and and getting down there you just purchased your your latest uh golf cart you might say uh um, yeah and uh explain to us what you got and what you got going on yeah. So I, I had a turbo S before, um, and it was, it was really fun. I built it into a pre-runner. We went and pre-ran a few times, Baja 500 and stuff. And then, the you know, the pro R came out. So of course I had to get a pro R. So I got a pro R now and uh, we've been building it up a little bit here and there, um, did a lot of cool stuff to it. And it's just, th that thing has been, I, I had a pretty built turbo S and it had pretty much everything bolt on, on it. It wasn't built like a race car. Obviously the chassis wasn't, you know, the chassis was stock besides a cage works cage on it, but it was pretty built. And the stock pro r when i first got it um was better than the turbo s built so th that's how you know much of a difference it was between a pro r and a turbo s and i've had a lot of people ask me who have turbo s like hey should i is it worth it to get the pro r i'm like yes you know by far the suspension on it is the biggest difference you know just being able to go that much faster it just rides that much better uh, i have a four seater which personally i like and i would get a four seater anyways even if i only had two seats because i think that the longer wheelbase for baja specifically really really helps and makes a big difference because in the rough and the whoops and everything down there um it makes a big difference there's not a lot of tight technical stuff where you would need a two-seater whereas like if you're doing a lot of trail riding or rock crawling you'd obviously want the two-seater probably for the shorter wheelbase but in baja you're going to want that four seat wheelbase for sure i've always been a four seat guy myself um i enjoy the just the control you have over the car especially at high speed um yeah. and coming from a turbo s going into the, the pro r uh obviously the motor has you know its own characteristics and not being turboed and all that stuff um and you've got a few different upgrades on the car so far i think you've got you know some trailing or some uh radius rods and some you know front control stuff and and things like that but uh as far as the way that the suspension has changed the game, I think that people don't give it enough credit yet. 
like it's it's still kind of yeah. building up its momentum of impact on their industry but the the technology and the and the live control of the valving and and just the different modes like the way the computer controls it in baja mode versus rock mode or whatever the case is um and how it really kind of plants the car differently into corners and and all that stuff um really is you know a product of this off-road racing scene right like we've we've seen that yeah. electronic controlled shock stuff starting a number of years ago and then eventually it made its way into these utvs um and even into like the ford raptor and all that kind of stuff right um are we seeing a like a turning point in our industry where it becomes more about who can afford the bigger, badder car, or is it still uh, is racing still coming down to the team and the prep and the racer and the the investment of experience and time behind the wheel? Well, racing is always going to come down to the prep. It one hundred percent. I don't care how much money you have. If you have somebody that's not doing a good prep on the car, or they forget one little thing during the prep, your race is over. I don't, I don't care who you are. You know that goes for anybody. So it's always going to start with the prep, no matter what you're racing, what class, anywhere, F one, UTV, anything. It's always going to come down to the prep. The driver just drives the car. If the car is no good, it doesn't matter how good the driver is. It's not going to work. You know. So it, it always comes down to that. And you know, as far as like the, the new the new utvs coming out the new technology you have to do a lot less to them than you used to so that makes it that much easier on the prep and that type of stuff because you're not worried about so much stuff like with the pro r for example i put some zrp trailing arm not trailing arms radius rods and tie rods on it and it's pretty much good to go. It still has the stock arms on it. It has the stock ball joints. You know, a bunch of people give these ball joints crap about braking. Well, I have 900 miles on mine, most of it in Baja and knock on wood here. It hasn't broken yet. So it, I think that's more of a driver thing than anything. Um, but the new ones coming out, you have to do less to them to be able to have them do more, you know, so you're not putting as much money into them. They cost more obviously, but you don't have to do as much to them because technology has advanced to the point where they're basically building these already kind of built. Even look at the cage on the new pro R that's a legit cage. You don't have to change that cage. If you don't want to, it looks funny. I didn't like the way it looks. That's why I put a cage works on mine, but it is plenty strong. It is two inch. It is, it's thicker than before. It's not bolted anywhere. It's all one piece. Like that's a legit cage. The turbo S cage was crap, right? Everybody changed those. You have to right away. They already upgraded from that. Now you don't have to, you know, so they're just, it's constantly evolving, evolving, evolving. And I'm sure that the next ones that come out are going to be even better. <laughs> Yeah, I can't wait for the next wave, right? Like we've been waiting for the Pro R for so long and then eventually it came out and, and it's starting a whole new class of racing in, in all these different series. Um, and I can't wait for, you know, the next wave, which I believe will be the DCTs and, you know, um, other competitive four cylinders and things like that. Um, but I, I, I feel like at some point, you know, there's going to be this reconciliation in racing where it's like, okay, we, we've grown so many classes now where we have to start thinking about just maybe consolidating some of these and, and having them because they perform on the same level. They're just different vehicles. Um, there's a big debate around that, right? Like there's a big debate of like these trucks competing against UTVs and, and all that. Yeah. What's, what's your opinion on that? Cause I've heard both sides where it's, you know, Hey, if you can go, if you can compete, you can compete. Like it doesn't matter. And on the other side, I've heard, you know, size and weight are a big part of safety and, and making sure these races are, you know, going off without casualties and things like that. Um, and then, you know, some other guys are just like class, like diehards, like you have to have these classes, like, otherwise it doesn't work. Um, for them. And so kind of what's your take on kind of how we've gotten to this point of like multiple different styles of racing converging into multiple classes that are kind of the same thing. Well, I think there's a place for everybody and it depends on what race you're doing also. So if you're doing a short lap race, like this instance, this uh, coming up weekend is rage at the river, right? It's a 13 mile course at Laughlin. It's fast. It's wide open. Most of the time there's big holes. It's, it's really rough, right? But you're not racing UTVs with trucks at a race like that because of what you just said, that would be too dangerous because you have 13 miles. You're going to have lots of lapping going on. You're going to have a lot of people on the course. It's going to be trucks side by side with UTVs that could get ugly really fast. So that doesn't work. They run their own heats at a race like that, which is how it should be. Now, when you go to the Baja 1000, the trucks start in the front, right? Then the UTVs start behind all the trucks. If a UTV is fast enough to be able to pass a truck, 
that's fine. They'll get past the truck, but it's like one truck here, one truck there, one truck there. And there's room to pass, hopefully all that. It's not as dangerous as it would be on a short course loop track. So it totally depends on what race you're talking about. And as long as it's set up correctly, I don't see a problem with them all racing together. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's definitely some, some, logistical issues that you would you kind of are forced to do especially like here in the states with lap races and stuff like that uh when you get out into the desert um like you said there is the opportunity to do safe racing but there's a lot of ego involved right there's a lot of like these truck guys that are like million dollar trucks they're not going to ever want to race with a sixty thousand dollar utv right like it's just there's this 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 prestige level like an f1 F1 racer is never going to want to race a nascar (laughs) guy right it's just like it's below them to even consider the thought um and so so there's definitely a lot of opinion when it comes to baja um that you know is always entertaining to listen to there's a lot of fun banter there um but uh but yeah i think that you know as a sport you know we have to consider these these angles right like we got to consider you know how is the how's the next five years of this going to grow and 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 which direction are we going to take it um and i think that the baja is kind of cool in the fact that you don't have so many racers that you have to blend them but you can make accommodations and i think that's kind of the smart way of doing it yeah, I mean, I've literally been in Baja before in a trophy truck and we had some issues and we were down a little bit and then we got stuck in the middle of the night in this gnarly silt area, right? There was a car stuck in front of us and then we got stuck and now we're both just stuck in the middle of nowhere. And we were there all night long. Like we couldn't dig out. If we did, we went five feet at a time. It was just, it sucked. And during that night, here come the freaking golf carts and they just drive right, <laughs> right by us. And I'm, I'm just like, are you effing kidding me right now? Like, you know, we're in this, you know, 500, $700,000 trophy truck sitting here buried and these freaking golf carts just drove around us. Like it's no big deal, you know? So it, uh, it, it definitely, there's a little, you know, a little bit for everything, but now if we get in the whoops, we'll fly right by those guys. Right. So it just depends on uh, what scenario we're in, but yeah, it's, it's fun. It's fun seeing them mixed in, you know, together. And, it's good and bad because now you can literally have a guy go to a dealership. He can finance a car. He can put do some stuff to it and have it be race legal. And you can add, and he can now be a racer, right? So I kind of don't like that all the time because now you have really inexperienced people coming out and intermixing in some of these races where they have no experience. They shouldn't even be there. You know, they should be starting in another class from the beginning. So that that's a bad part. However, maybe that's also a good part because maybe they go and do one race and they're like, oh wow, that was we did this totally wrong like let's go back and let's do it correctly now you have a new racer coming in the sport so it's it's good and bad you know that's where you get people talking crap on them saying stuff like that or you know i don't know i'm kind of open to it but i do wish there was a little bit of a requirement before you could actually enter a race i don't actually like it that anybody can just go like i said go finance something go put a cage in it and come race i think that could be a little bit different I think the, uh, what was it? Uh, is it King of Hammers that's doing like a, like a greenhorn class or something like that, where it's like all new people, only new people can be in the class or something like that. Yeah. I think they just did that. Actually. It was a couple of weeks ago. They were, uh, it was like a newbie thing and Dave was out there in Johnson Valley showing them, you know, the ropes and everything. And I think that's a great idea. You know, I think there should be more of that stuff. You should be a requirement in my opinion, before you can even enter a race that you have to either show some prior experience in other racing or, you know, different series or something. Or if you don't have anything, you have to take a class or something like that. I mean, what road race can you go just enter and go do out of there? You know, you can't just go to NASCAR and race it and show up, you know, there's, there's requirements for all these things you have to have a license you have to have this that so i think there i don't think you should have to like have gnarly requirements but at least take a class like you just said like okay you got to come over here for the day and we're going to teach you desert racing etiquette and how to what to do in different situations and stuff like that and score does have a rookie meeting it's usually hosted by kurt leduc before the score races but it's at the driver meeting and half the people probably don't even go to it probably more than half there's probably 10 percent of the newbies that go to the newbie meeting because it's not a requirement Right. And I and I think I like the idea of having like an entry level series like to match kind of maybe some of the the upper level series where obviously like nobody's going to get I mean, I mean, it's possible somebody could get a million dollar trophy truck and go race it. But yeah, that's very unlikely that that's going to happen where somebody's going to show up first timer, never done it before with all the equipment, all the team, all the network. And, and make things happen but it's more likely to happen on a utv side or or an entry level side or sure. or something like that or like a um, the bug series or whatever um and and they could potentially 
cause some problems if they're undereducated, right? So I yeah. like the idea of having like this, like a mirrored class that's like, you're, you're, you're able to come in after the main race and do your own series, your own class that is kind of like, you're going to experience the, the kind of like the worst conditions of the course possible after everybody's <laughs> raced it. And then, but you're your own class and you can trophy it like that's fine, but that's like a prerequisite. Like if you want to be in the race series, you have to have this one year of doing it first before you get into the real race. Yeah. I mean, I don't think anybody should ever be excluded from racing, right? Like I'm not trying to say that at all. I just think there should be, you know, a little bit of something you have to do. I don't know exactly what, but like you said, maybe something like that or like the class that Dave did, you know, you, you got to go do this. You just, you got to do something. So you don't have people out there that have no, no idea at all because they're a safety hazard to themselves. They're a safety hazard to other racers. They're a safety hazard to spectators. You know, there's a, a lot of experience that a lot of these people have. And then somebody that just comes in brand new, that's great. You have to start somewhere, right? You know, can't just come into everything with experience, but I think there should be certain stepping stones and it is cool to see different series like, um, the DP four series or some of the district 38 or 37, whatever those series are, they have UTV races, you know, and they're a little bit more grassroots, um, type thing. So I think it's good if people start in series like that and then work their way up. So at least they have a little bit of experience. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely we we never want to tell somebody they have to work harder just to get into the sport. But at the same time, you know, you don't like my kids are in wrestling right now or and, you know, they don't just instantly go to varsity. Right. Even if they're really good, they don't instantly. The coach is never going to let them go straight to varsity without proving themselves first. Um, and I feel like when we're talking about just the the amount of safety involved and the amount of like just logistics involved, it, it definitely is something that we should as a industry consider is the idea that we have a pathway like you know that was one thing that like the the smaller utvs from polaris opened up was like the idea that these youth racers could could evolve into a pro racer over time by, by learning and, and experiencing on these smaller vehicles and not be just kind of like this 13 16 year old jumping into the sport um and i thought that was super cool and it's it's really showing off now with some of these up-and-comer racers that are, are so young and, and really able to throw down with the best of them uh, in pro series turbo and all this other stuff um uh as far as covering these events and i might get you in a little trouble here the <laughs> the favorite series in class to cover trophy truck or golf cart or whatever what's what's the one that you kind of like draws you in well it's the trophy truck obviously i mean i don't think anybody could say much different than that really <laughs> so uh as far as locations go i mean you've been to most of these places uh what's what's your favorite destination uh baja for sure you know not, nothing is better than baja and honestly i don't even really like the baja 1000 my favorite race is the baja 500 i think that is the best race in off-road racing that you can do it's during the summer or early summer so the weather's always nice the course is long but it's not too long that you're over it. Like the Baja 1000, you're over it when you're done, right? That's a long day. It's a long day chasing. It's a long day racing. That's a long course. You just, you want it to be done when you're done with it. And it's cold because it's in the winter. You know, it might be foggy. It could be rainy. It's just, that's a gnarly race. Like it's fun, obviously, but it's not my most fun race. The most fun race to me is the Baja 500 because you get to experience a little bit of everything. It usually goes on the coast. So you can see the beach. You can stay at the fun towns along the coast. It's just, I, I think the Baja 500 is the best race out there. Um, so to kind of wind down here, uh, you said you're going to be going to the race this weekend. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Rage of the river, uh, the snore race is coming up this weekend, which snores another great one. If you, you know, if you don't want to jump right into Baja or a best in the desert race, come out and race snore. You know, I think it's a $700 entry, something about that. The sportsman classes are probably a little bit less. They have every kind of class there. They have the golf cart classes. They have trophy truck or unlimited truck, whatever they call it there. Um, it's, it's a fun race. This is it's at Laughlin this weekend and it's uh 12, 13 miles. You do five laps a day, I think Saturday and Sunday. So if your car breaks on Saturday, you can at least fix it, get it back together, and then go do whatever you want to do on Sunday. Have a little bit of fun. But, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to get out there. I'm racing with my buddy Phil Casey in a uh, Pistol Pete uh, Baja Light truck, and uh, we're going to race Class 7200. I think there's almost 10 entries in that class, which for Class 7, is uh, it's a mini truck class. And um, it'll, be, it'll be fun. It'll be fun to get out there and uh, mix it up with everybody. I've heard a lot this week from different racers that uh... – this is one of their favorite races of the year. What makes this, this race different than all the other races? 
Yeah, honestly, this is one of the most fun races. Besides the Baja 500, this is probably my second most fun race. And it's because it's it's in Laughlin. It's right by the casinos. So you can just stay at the casino. They're like a mile away. So rooms are super easy. It's cheap. Um, you, you get two days of racing. So like I said, you can have one person drive each day, which is what we're doing. Like Phil's going to drive on Saturday. I'm going to drive on Sunday if he doesn't break the car on Saturday. Um, you can have different co-driver each day. The pits are, there's really no pitting. If you have a problem, you're pretty much just done so there's no it's, there's a little hot pit where you maybe come in and get a tire or take a hood off if it's flapping or something like that but it's just super low stress and and the race itself is fun because it's 13 miles and you're just you're as fast as you can go for 13 miles there's there's no relaxing like if you relax you're getting passed by somebody you know there's a lot of people on the track at once and it's just it's an all-around fun race it doesn't cost a lot to go do it it's you know relatively local at laughlin it's not too far away from most people and like i said there's hotels and it's just it's an easy race to go do how about on the spectator spectator side or are, is that something that people can show up and have a good time or is it just for the race teams like some of these other bigger races no, honestly, this is one of the best races to go spectate because you don't have to do much. They have a whole infield section that, you know, has back and forth. They build jumps in it. There's a, uh, there's a spectator hill where you can just stand on the hill if you want. They have a grandstands that they set up. So they have food and drink and seats for you in the infield. Um, the cars are constantly coming around too. It's not like in Baja where you might not see anybody for hours, right? In between a class or something. Uh, and then you have to move and go to another spot. You can literally just go spectate the infield and you'll see cars coming by all all the time and they start two or three wide so it's kind of exciting drag race off the start with multiple cars so it's it's a great race for spectating so we obviously have that race coming up uh what are what else are you looking forward to in the near near future that you're getting excited about and getting ready for yeah, there's that race. And then, you know, we start over in January. We got Parker. They moved uh, the Parker 250 and the Parker 425. They merged them together. So they're actually having the Parker 250 on Saturday, early in January, way earlier than it's ever been before. And that got a little controversy, actually. Not a lot of people liked that, it sounded like, just because it's kind of close to the holidays. But the Parker 250, which is the UTVs, and them are going to race on Saturday. And then the Parker 425 is going to go on Sunday. And that's going to be the trucks and the buggies on Sunday. So that's the first big best in the desert race of the year and then uh, right after that a few weeks later it's going to be king of the hammers so we'll be out at king of the hammers i'll be doing the commentary for the desert races again so saturday and sunday the first weekend of it well the first weekend after the motos i guess um i'll be out there and then it's uh, san felipe time after that and then we start the score season all over again yeah that's a uh, january is always a crazy time i always forget like you know, I get distracted with the holidays, get distracted with, you know, different family events and, and kind of winding down the year. You always forget that January is so stinking packed full of racing and, and events. Uh, there's a lot going on in January, uh, especially for somebody like you that's trying to both race and cover, you know, multiple things at once uh, in a month. So um, looking forward to that. Uh, where can we follow you? Do uh, some uh, some entertainment value stuff and, and how can we see these races being covered by what you guys do? Yeah, it's just at Fishgistics, you know, go on uh, either Instagram or uh, uh, Facebook, and that's that's where it is. That's all you got to do. <laughs> you just got to learn how to say Fishgistics and uh, make things happen. Um, so you can follow him on Instagram and Facebook. Instagram is kind of like the place I go to to follow him. He'll, he'll post screenshots of the results and stuff like that as well. Um, and then Facebook is kind of where you go to have a discussion around what's going on. Uh, and then uh, YouTube, uh, you know, doesn't have as many followers as the other two platforms. Is that something that you're working on growing? Yeah, I actually just started doing that uh, maybe last year, you know, doing the stream on there. It was kind of when people were stepping away from Facebook and they're like, oh, how can I watch your, your live updates? Because I'm not on Facebook anymore. So I started doing them to YouTube also. I hadn't really posted a lot before that. So, yeah, during the races now, every hour on the hour, if you don't have Facebook, you can just go to Fishgistics on YouTube and you can put it on your TV. Actually, that's becoming really popular because a lot of people are just putting it on their TV, watching it in the background, watching it in the shop while they work on their cars, you know, on their iPad whatever you can just go on there so you don't have to have a login you don't have to have a facebook account anything to to watch on there yeah that's kind of how i've consumed it just because i'm a multitasker you know pretty much every day of my life i do multiple things at once and whether i'm in the shop in the shop i'll have it on the tv or i'll have you know just doing my um chromecast or apple tv or whatever uh and then you know if i'm working i'll have it in a window off to the side or something on the computer uh and i think that's a more and more the case now with people that are consuming this content is that they have kind of like auxiliary things especially with desert racing right like if there's not a bunch of action going on you're not staring at the screen per se 
and commentary is a big part of that consumption device, right? Like you have to listen to it. And I think that's why yeah. we all gravitate to podcasts and why we do a lot of these things that we're doing nowadays uh, is because we can multitask and do things at multiple, uh, multiple things at once. Uh, so super important to get people involved that are, are having a good discussion is, is always great. Um, and that's why I kind of like was, you know, before I even asked you to come on the, on the episode, it was like, I recognize that this year in Baja, there was a lot more of that kind of integration of the discussion and, and talking and back and forth and stuff like that. So, uh, super cool to see that happening, starting super cool to see the industry growing. Um, and, uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, as, as much as I can being a Northwest guy, being involved with uh, a lot of this stuff that happens down South. Um, but, uh, yeah, so follow, follow, um, uh, Austin on Facebook and, and Instagram at Fistgistics. Uh, you can follow it on YouTube while he starts to do his posts there as well. If you're not a Facebook person, um, and, uh, yeah, you can follow our podcast on Apple, Spotify, um, Google, iHeartRadio, all those different places, as well as YouTube, uh, you can see uh, Austin's beautiful face and backgrounds <laughs> that he sets up. Um, but uh, yeah, take care. T till the next time, guys. Peace. Peace.